It's fun that we're talking about uh, goodness and what flows out of our hearts today in the kids' moment, uh, because we're also talking about that in our time in Luke 11. Um, And as we begin, have you ever noticed how many movies and books and games uh, center around a battle between good and evil? Have you ever noticed how often those themes come up? At our house, we are Star Wars fans, and in every movie, even if the characters themselves don't realize it, uh, there's a cosmic battle of good and evil playing out around them. Uh, It's the same with the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the Thanos narrative arc. Uh, While individual movies may have focused on smaller battles and lesser challenges, uh, in those end scenes, there's always that moment where you're like, whoa, something big and sinister is looming in the background. Uh, And it would culminate in a final battle of good versus evil. Uh, It's interesting, we love these narratives so much that we will even apply uh, that language to sporting events. I don't know if you managed to watch the game last night, but it's very easy to get into an us versus them narrative. Uh, Did you know that there are more Canadian players on the Oilers, so the Oilers have to be Canada's team? Is it us versus them? There's there's like 23 uh, Canadian Oilers that played for the Oilers this year, and there's only 13 Canadians that played for Florida this year. So, I mean, this is our team, right? It's an us versus them. Uh, Or... I don't know if you watch much of that game, but uh, while Bobrovsky is not actually a Bond villain, uh, he sure seemed like the bad guy in that story last night. I mean, that guy was a wall. And and so we often entertain ourselves with these stories. We organize the events in our lives around these kind of narratives. But sometimes we can forget that the Bible tells the actual story of good and evil. And in Jesus' earthly ministry, he came to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus stepped into a world at war, he declared his kingdom, and he demonstrated his kingdom by pushing back the darkness in the world and bringing hope and healing to all that he encountered. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus disarmed Satan. Through his sacrificial death for us, Jesus took upon himself our sin and our shame, and through Jesus, our sins can be forgiven. We can be set free. We're no longer enslaved to the power of sin. And through his resurrection, Jesus conquered death, and he made it possible for us to experience his resurrection life. And so Satan is a defeated foe, but he continues to rage in this world, along with a host of fallen angels. He's fighting an insurgency against God, though his end is already written, and he'll be destroyed along with his force by one word from Jesus. The Bible actually tells this story of good and evil. It tells about the origin of the darkness that we experience in our world. And today, as we continue our Apprenticing to Jesus series, we're going to step into a conversation between Jesus and some critics about this battle between good and evil as we read Luke 11, 14 to 26. But before I read that passage and before we go down this this trail, I want to remind you briefly of what we've been trying to do in this sermon series. Uh, Since September, we've been in a sermon series called Apprenticing to Jesus. We've been journeying through the book of Luke. And we're using the language of apprenticeship because this language helps us to understand the relationship that Jesus calls us into as his followers. The Greek word for, uh, for disciple, for learner, is mathetes. And this was actually a first century educational model um, that is kind of like our version of apprenticeship. Uh, rabbis, teachers, uh, would travel through the countryside. They would go to towns and villages. Uh, and they would invite people to uh, begin to follow them, to walk in this learning relationship with them. Uh, so often in Jesus' day, the rabbis were looking at the best of the best. It was almost like a hands-on doctoral program where you were doing life with your rabbi. But as Jesus wandered through the countryside, he called these fishermen and these tax collectors, these zealots, and he said, hey, I want you to follow me. When Jesus walked up to Simon and Andrew on that beach, when he walked up to Matthew at that tax collection booth, uh, they understood that they were being invited into this discipleship, this apprenticeship, this hands-on learning experience where they were going to join Jesus on mission as his students. They were going to spend time with him. They were going to learn from him with the goal being that they would become like Jesus and carry on his works, carry on his message and his mission. That was the goal of this relationship, to become like their master so much that they could carry on his mission. And as you finish off the gospel accounts, like Matthew 28, as you move into Acts 1, you see that's exactly what happened. 
First, when Jesus was with them, the apprentices began to look and do the things of Jesus. And then uh, in the book of Acts, as they're filled with the Holy Spirit, you see them going out and doing the work of Jesus, taking the mission of Jesus, the message of Jesus, out to greater and greater and greater parts of the world. They continued the mission of Jesus. They invited others to become apprentices who invite others to become apprentices. And so if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus, then you have started that apprenticeship journey with him. You may not realize it, but you've been signed up. And as apprentices through this series, we've been learning to join Jesus on mission. We've been learning the importance of spending time with him, becoming like him, and doing the things that Jesus did. And so, as apprentices... As we interact with this conversation in Luke 11, uh, even though the content may seem strange and foreign to us, we have the opportunity in these moments to learn from Jesus, to adjust our worldview to match the worldview of Jesus, and to begin to see and interact with the world the way that he did. Uh, one of the things that I'm finding interesting about going through the book of Luke, kind of, uh, you know, kind of section by section by section by section, is, is sometimes I knew where things were. Um, you know, the, the Sermon on the Plain in Luke, the, uh, the, 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 the Lord's Prayer in Luke, but I didn't kind of realize how it all flowed together. Uh, and so last week, fun sermon. It was the uh, Jesus' teaching on the Lord's Prayer, uh, some beautiful teaching about prayer that just really encouraged my heart. And then I was looking into this week, I was like, oh, we're talking about demons today. All right. That's what happens when you go verse by verse. Buckle up, friends. If you want a beautiful, encouraging message about prayer, last week. Uh, this week is all about, uh, is all about this worldview that, that so often in the West we don't have. Uh, so let me just read it, and then we'll talk about it. Luke eleven fourteen 14 to 26 says this. One day, Jesus cast out a demon from a man who couldn't speak. And when the demon was gone, the man began to speak. The crowds were amazed. But some of them said, no wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. Others, trying to test Jesus, demanded that he showed them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. He knew their thoughts, so he said, any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A family splintered by feuding will fall apart. You say I'm empowered by Satan, but if Satan is divided and fighting against himself, how can his kingdom survive? And if I'm empowered by Satan, what about your own exorcists? They cast out demons too, so they will condemn you for what you've said. But if I'm casting out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. For when a strong man is fully armed and guards his palace, his possessions are safe. Until someone even stronger attacks and overpowers him, strips him of his weapons, and carries off his belongings. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me, and anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert searching for rest. But when it finds none, it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds that its former home is all swept in in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they all enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. Now I'm going to stop here because from this point, Jesus is going to go interact with the crowd in different places. He's going to talk about the nature of blessing and he'll respond to the crowd's desire for a sign to prove his authority. Uh, but for today, we want to focus on this interaction about the battle with evil. Uh, and because it is a little bit of a strange one, I want us to pray before we unpack this conversation. And so, Father God, we come to you in these moments and we are looking for wisdom. We're looking you, for you to show us the world, to show us reality as it really is. Would you encourage us as we talk about these things? Would you help us to see, that once again, Jesus, that you are greater than it all? Would you help us to understand that you are the victorious one and you extend uh, your victory and your authority to us as your followers? Would you uh, give us courage and faith and help us to understand these things that you are saying to us today? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, last week as we were reading Luke 11, 1 to 13, uh, Jesus had this beautiful time of teaching about prayer. Uh, but in Luke 11, it was all prompted by one of his disciples asking him to teach them to pray. So the disciple asked the question and that prompted Jesus to extend this teaching section about prayer. And in a similar way, this teaching conversation is prompted by others. 
Uh, this time, it's by unspoken criticism from the crowd around Jesus. And it all begins when Jesus does something good. He declares and demonstrates the rule and reign of God by casting, out a de by casting a demon out of a man who's been unable to speak. With the evil spirit gone, the man's speech is restored, and the crowd is amazed. And I think it's important, before we begin to talk about the reaction of the crowd in Jesus' conversation, to acknowledge that Jesus deals with a spiritual issue that's causing a physical problem. In casting out this evil spirit, the man who was oppressed is healed and able to speak. Now, there have been times in Christian history where uh, scholars have looked at these deliverance stories and rejected spiritual causes. Uh, in the uh, late 1800s, there was this move uh, called the Search for the Historical Jesus. And uh, coming from a Western Enlightenment worldview, uh, where they didn't believe that anything supernatural was possible, uh, they just took a red pen, and anything that seemed to be supernatural, they just crossed out. And they said, no, this stuff didn't actually happen. This is superstition. This is, you know, embellishment. We're just looking for, like, the real Jesus between all of these uh, supernatural stories. Uh, and so there have been times where scholars have looked at these stories and said, you want to know what? It, there's no real battle, um, and they looked for physical causes to explain the sickness present. Uh, sometimes in that mindset, they would still say that Jesus performed miracles, that he brought healing, uh, but there was no understanding of Jesus' role in a spiritual battle. But that's not the way the Bible describes Jesus interacting with the world. When you begin to cross out lines of scripture like that, you are putting your worldview onto the Bible. It's a very dangerous place to be. And so if we let the Bible speak for itself, uh, the Bible describes Jesus interacting with the spiritual and supernatural world. Uh, Jesus was very clear that evil spirits are real. He was very clear that there is a real spiritual battle. Jesus was clear that the spiritual battle can impact our physical health. And Jesus, as he ministered, he was able to discern between physical causes and spiritual causes of symptoms. There are times where Jesus dealt with a physical problem to meet a physical need. But there are other times when Jesus dealt with a spiritual problem to heal a physical need. And Jesus could discern between these causes. And in his ministry, Jesus also interacted with Satan, who he called the accuser. He taught others about Satan. And Jesus was very clear that there is a spiritual battle going on around us. Now, throughout the entire Bible, through all 66 books, you get glimpses and insights into this battle. We know from Genesis that God created the world without sin and without evil. We know that God created the, the physical world and the spiritual world, and he declared that it was good, good, and very good. In the beginning, there was no sin, there was no sickness, there was no death, there was no darkness. But in Isaiah 14 and in Ezekiel 28, we get glimpses, we, we learn in part that as the spiritual realm, as part of the spiritual realm, God created a hierarchy of angels, uh, spiritual beings with free will to serve him and his creation. At some point, one of these spiritual beings, an, an archangel named Lucifer, grew jealous of God and led a rebellion against God, taking one third of the host of heaven with him. As part of Satan's rebellion in Genesis 3, Satan tempted Eve in the garden and convinced her and Adam uh, to join him in rebellion against God. And when Adam and Eve sinned, sickness and death entered the world. All of creation came under a curse, and, and Satan and his fallen angels gained a measure of authority and control over the world. The darkness that we experience in our world, world is the darkness of a world deeply impacted by sin and sickness and death. And as the enemy of God, Satan knows that he can't harm God. He, he can't stand against God, but through sin and death, through lies and distraction, through temptations and manipulation and oppressive systems, Satan opposes God by ensnaring people. People were created to know and be known by God, and he prevents us from coming to God for salvation and life, knowing that he can't take on God. Satan puts his efforts to uh, deceive and distract and keep us from coming to know the God who we were created to love and worship. So this is the battle that Jesus entered. In his earthly ministry, Jesus identified those who were oppressed by demonic spirits and in authority, Jesus rebuked those spirits. He cast those demons out. He brought healing and hope to those who'd been oppressed. 
In Luke 9, Jesus gave uh, his authority to his apprentices to join him in that mission. And then in Luke 10, he gave that authority to 72 other apprentices, and they also began to go on mission to bring healing and to bring deliverance. In the book of Acts, we see many people impacted by these demonic forces, and we see many different followers of Jesus commanding those demonic forces to leave in Jesus' name. And as I said earlier, through his death and resurrection, Jesus disarmed Satan. Jesus made a way for us to overcome sin and death. As we acknowledge Jesus as Lord, as we confess our need for forgiveness and rescue, Jesus breaks the power of sin in our lives, and he joins us into his resurrection life. And so even though we still wrestle with sin and we still experience sickness and death, we're we're impacted by the sins of others still, these no longer have the final word in our lives. This is the battle that Jesus entered. This is the victory that Jesus won, that he was in the process of winning as he uh, taught this teaching section in Luke 11. And so with all that being said, as we step back into Luke 11, Jesus recognized there is a man with physical symptoms that are caused by a spiritual root. And so he deals with the demonic, he rebukes the spirit, the man was healed, and he could speak. It's an amazing miracle. Many in the crowd are amazed, but uh, there were some at the back. They had their arms kind of crossed, and they began to whisper to one another, you know, this guy can do that just because he's, he's empowered by Satan, right? He, he's, he, can, he can kick out the demons because he's filled with the demons. He's, he's in league with the devil. And so they began to whisper this about Jesus. And again, it's worth noting that these people in the crowd, they were likely the Jewish religious leaders. They didn't have a problem with the deliverance. They recognized that Jesus delivered. Uh, They just weren't sure where the power came from. And because of their jealousy, uh, they were were convinced that he was working for the wrong team. Uh, So the crowd recognized that that this spiritual battle was going on that could impact the physical world, but they just thought that Jesus was not from God. But Jesus knew their thoughts. And so he responded to these thoughts with a two-part argument designed to prove his ministry was, in fact, coming from God. First, he used some pretty plain logic. He said, guys, a kingdom divided against itself will fall. I mean, he used a couple different images. He said, hey, a a, a kingdom's not going to prosper if it's in the middle of a civil war. A family's not going to prosper if it's divided amongst itself. I mean, Jesus comes against these critics with simple logic. If Satan is fighting against Satan, then his kingdom is already doomed. And the implication that is, if someone else is fighting Satan, then that person has to be doing it as a representative of God. There's only two choices. Then, as his second argument, Jesus points to the deliverance ministry of the own people in the Jewish community. There were other people practicing deliverance ministry. We actually encounter some of them in Acts 19. There were other Jewish leaders trying to help people oppressed by demonic forces. They were mostly associated with the priests and the Pharisees. And Jesus says, hey guys, if my ministry is empowered by Satan, then who's empowering the ministry of your own deliverers? Jesus says those Jewish leaders in the ministry know that, their, uh, that their, their commissioning comes from God. And so Jesus says, hey, your own leaders are going to rebuke you for these evil thoughts. In both arguments, Jesus presents his critics with a choice to make. To see in Jesus' ministry the evidence of the kingdom of God. And to turn to God in belief and trust. The only way Jesus could do these things is that he was doing was to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And if he was empowered by the Holy Spirit, then the kingdom of God was near. Rescue and help was on its way. He said, guys, you need to make a choice here. Take a look at what I'm doing, recognizing that it has to come from God. Will you humble yourselves now and recognize that the kingdom of God is near? Then Jesus began to teach the crowd three realities about this spiritual battle. First, Jesus teaches about his own power and authority over evil. This is where Jesus talks about the strong man. Jesus says that when a strong man guards his possessions, when when he, you know, bars the doors, he's able to keep his possessions safe until someone stronger comes along and ties him up. And through this story, Jesus teaches that he is stronger than Satan. He is the stronger man. Jesus is stronger than any and every and all evil forces. Jesus wants us to realize the strong man has been tied up. 
It's interesting, one of Satan's tricks is to try to get us to think that he is equal and opposite to God. Uh, sometimes it's by bringing in different thoughts from kind of Eastern philosophy uh, about balance. Sometimes it's, uh, it's through different religions where, where Satan tries to elevate himself up to the same level as Jesus. But Satan's not God. He is limited in power. He's limited in location. Uh, through Jesus' death and resurrection, two of Satan's biggest weapons, sin and death, have been stripped from his hands. The strong man has been tied up, but that does not mean he is not still kicking and screaming and raging. Uh, one of the ways uh, Peter talks about Satan is as a roaring lion, right? A lion's kind of scary. If you've ever been in a place where uh, a lion is roaring, you're like, man, that's a lot of noise. But uh, it's a lot of noise, but the, the, the lion has been tied up in that case. The lion is caged. And the invitation to us as followers of Jesus is to recognize that Satan has, be bound, has been bound up and we are to be a people who light up the darkness and lead his captives to freedom. Second thing that Jesus teaches about this battle is that when it comes to spiritual authority, there is an exclusivity. Anyone who's not working with Jesus is working against him. As I was reflecting on this idea, what stood out to me is that there's no neutrality in this spiritual battle. Uh, sometimes Satan tries to make a lot of things seem neutral. There are a lot of spiritual things that people trust, a lot of uh, spiritual practices that, that seem you know, neutral and good and harmless. And part of what Satan is doing is to try to make a lot of things that are really uh, looking for darkness, that he tries to make a lot of those things seem a little bit more gray. But here Jesus tells us that behind some of those seemingly innocent practices, apart from Christ is bondage. And so to look for spiritual victory and authority and power apart from Christ is to actually be working against God's plans for your life. Earlier in Luke, uh, his disciples caught someone using the name of Jesus to bring deliverance to people. And there Jesus said that whoever's not against me is for me. But I think the difference here is to realize the necessity of coming to Jesus for this spiritual battle. There's salvation in no other name. There's authority and rescue in no other name. If you are looking for help in the spiritual battle, you need to come to Jesus. There, there's no other actual help any other place than Jesus when it comes to this spiritual battle. The third thing that Jesus teaches about the spiritual battle is that when ground is won from the enemy, it needs to be redeemed and filled. This is the story about the cleansed house. Jesus says that when an evil spirit is cast out of a person, it, it wanders around for a while, and then it tries to get back in. It tries to knock on the door. It looks through the windows again. Uh, Jesus uses the imagery of a house. And he says that when the evil spirit finds the house cleaned up but vacant, it goes and gets others, and together they make a greater mess than there was before. But as we think through what Jesus has said so far about the battle, uh, who is stronger than these demonic forces? Jesus, thank you, Katie, appreciate that. Uh, Jesus is stronger. And so if Jesus is inside us, filling those places and spaces, uh, if the Spirit is indwelling and has reclaimed those spaces that we've won from the enemy, uh, then when the enemy wanders by and looks in the window, who does he see inside? The stronger man. And so he's not going to try to mess with that place anymore uh, because Jesus has filled it. Now, it's important to note as we think about this, as we step into this imagery, it is important to note that believers can be impacted by evil spirits. Paul warns the church in Ephesians 4 that we aren't to give Satan inhabited spaces. He says that we're not to give into anger lest we give the devil a foothold in our lives. And even for believers, many things can open doors for the demonic. That sin and anger, bitterness, identity wounds, family sin patterns, curses, these broken places in our lives gives the enemy access. But as we allow Jesus to do his cleansing work in us, as we confess sin and deal with anger and forgive others and surrender bitterness and experience the Father's love and, and break family sin patterns and cut off curses, not only are those places in our lives cleansed, but we can invite more of the Holy Spirit, more of Jesus, the strongest man, to fill and redeem those places in our lives. It's a bit of a funny imagery, but I actually read a story in the news um, it was about a store. 
Uh, and basically, this store discovered that they had um, an unhoused person living in their store for three years. Uh, what was happening was that there was a special kind of crawl space to this place behind the sign. Uh, it wasn't a place that normally people went. The security guards, the security cameras, all the people uh, were moving through the regular store. But at night, there was a door that was unlocked that this person used to go in and sleep and live in this store rent-free for three or four years. That's kind of the imagery that Jesus is tapping into here, friends. He's saying that in our lives, uh, there can be places and spaces where we crack a door, where we crack a window to the work of darkness in our life, but it's not something to be afraid of. We need to recognize that Jesus is stronger and he wants to. Uh, in the same way as we were talking with the kids, he wants to help us deal with the garbage and the old socks in our life so that he can fill those places and spaces in greater and greater ways. In January of this year, we had a group of people from our church go up to a soul care conference in Edmonton. They had the chance to learn these principles, and more importantly, they had the opportunity to allow Jesus to do this deep work in their lives. And as I talk with them six months later, I can see the change, joy, more of the light, more of the love of Jesus as, uh, as they've allowed Jesus to, to fill more of them as they've dealt with some of these things in their lives. As apprentices of Jesus, as people who are spending time with him and becoming like him and doing the things that Jesus did, this is the worldview of Jesus, that there is a spiritual battle raging around us, but Jesus is the victorious one. Jesus has all authority in heaven, on earth, and he calls us to enter the battle. We do that not by fighting against flesh and blood, we're not trying to beat up on people, but we do this by fighting against the powers and principalities, against the evil powers, the, the evil in this world. And we do that simply by standing firm in Christ, by resisting the devil so that he flees from us, by standing firm against his schemes and lies. And we also enter the battle by bringing hope and healing to those around us, to those who are held captive to a world at war. We do this by speaking the name of Jesus by going in his name with his authority to those around us. We do this by fighting the battle first in ourselves, confessing sin, dealing with anger, forgiving others, surrendering bitterness. And we do this by calling others to apprentice to Jesus. As we do, we join Jesus on mission. And through this, people come to realize that the kingdom of God is among us. This is what Jesus was teaching as he began to interact with the crowd, as he brought freedom and hope and healing to this man as the crowd began to murmur jesus said guys the kingdom of god is near <laughs> which side are you on are you going to get on board with the work that god wants to do so with that in mind let's pray father god we thank you for your word and we thank you for those difficult places and spaces those things in your word that uh, we may not spend a lot of time thinking about, but the way that you teach us to recognize that there is more than we can see and touch. We thank you that in this spiritual battle, Jesus, that you have all authority in heaven and on earth. We thank you that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Uh, Jesus, we thank you for your authority. We thank you that your victory on the cross uh, has brought us freedom from sin and death. We thank you that you have disarmed our enemy, and we pray, Father, that you would help us to uh, stand in your victory in greater and greater ways. We pray that you'd help us to recognize that victory in greater and greater ways. And Jesus, as we look to join you on mission as your apprentices, as we spend time with you, would you help us to deal with any places of darkness that still linger in our own lives? And would you help us to bring your hope and healing to those around us? Uh, we thank you for your grace, and we pray that as we sing this last song, as we speak the name of Jesus, that you help us to remember it again that you have all authority in heaven and on earth.